Pacific. Slightly smaller than New York State, but it is the largest country in Central America. Also has the largest freshwater body. Um, and it has a population of about six million people. A quarter of those reside in the capital city of Managua. The country has historically been marred by disorder and violence. In 1978, violent opposition to President Somoza spread to all classes and resulted in a civil war that brought the Sandinista National, Li National Liberation Front, led by Daniel Ortega, to power in 1979. After losing elections in 1990-96-2001, the former Sandinista president, Daniel Ortega, was elected president in 2006, 2011, and 2016. After nearly 20 years of a stagnant alliance, Russian-Nicaraguan relations seem to have caught a second one. After decreasing at the fall of the Soviet Union in the 1990s, the past several years have seen a warming of this friendship, specifically since Vladimir Putin came to power in 2000 and the Sandinista president, Daniel Ortega, in 2007, characteristics of the soviet era relationship have reappeared in Nicaragua. Russia, it appears, is once more embedding itself into the Central American country diplomatically, economically, and militarily. Nicaragua has strong historical links to Moscow, and Russia certainly has experience with this Latin American country. With the philosophies of Marx, Engels, and Lenin as their driving force, when the Sandinistas rose to power in 1979, they knew the only way to reach their goal of building a socialist state in the Western Hemisphere was to forge a close relationship with the Soviet Union. Soon after taking power, Sandinista leaders went to Moscow to sign a party-to-party -party accord with the Soviet Communist Party. By 1982, the Sandinista military junta head and later President Daniel Ortega visited Moscow and met with Leonid Brezhnev. At the time, this alliance was not simply a response to the contra-opposition. The Soviet Union provided political, economic, and military support to the left-wing government of Nicaragua in the 1980s. In 1980, the Soviets opened a diplomatic mission in Managua. By 1983, the Soviet Union had become Nicaragua's top provider of wheat. Soviet oil provisions, which had increased six-fold since 1983 to 1984, began to fulfill 80% of Nicaragua's oil requirements. Further, he heavy weapons grants from the Soviet Union allowed the Sandinista government to build an impressive military. Starting in the early 1980s, a number of Soviet towed artillery guns, multiple rocket launchers, armored personnel carriers, heavily armed Mi-24 attack helicopters, and Mi-17 transport helicopters made their way to the Nicaraguan regime. Over 6,000 metric tons of weapons were shipped to Nicaragua from the Soviet Union in 1981 and 1982. In 1983, the amount had gone up to 11,000 metric tons, and by 1984, weapons deliveries from the Soviet Union exceeded all previous years. By 1989, Nicaragua received 576 million worth of military goods. At a certain point, the Sandinistas' conviction that with the Soviet Union's assistance, they would be able to challenge U.S. hegemony seemed almost attainable. The austere economic landscape of, of Nicaragua, coupled with its oppressive government, were seen by the Soviets as a perfect backdrop for the manifestation of leftist revolutionary groups. This Soviet saw an advantage in the Sandinista regime, so Nicaragua, in turn, turned out to be a beneficiary of Soviet assistance. From a Soviet standpoint, these revolutionary movements could be influenced, controlled, and even manipulated in order to achieve a revolutionary government that would not only be supportive of Soviet policy, but also enhance it in the Western Hemisphere. The relationship atrophied considerably after the 1990 elections in Nicaragua led to a loss of power for the Sandinista government, then followed the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, and although this did not cause a complete rupture of the relationship, economic aid from the successive Russian government to Nicaragua sharply dropped, while diplomatic and military activity in the region was similarly scaled back. The rise of President Vladimir Putin to power in, in Russia in 2000 and the return of Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua in 2007 renewed the likelihood that Moscow would seek an alliance with Nicaragua for the same strategic reasons the Soviet Union sought access to Central America so many years ago. As U.S. relations with Russia grew strained, namely due to issues in Georgia and Ukraine. Moscow showed new interest in the Central American region. The return of the Sandinista leaders set the stage for rekindling of diplomatic relations, 
Ortega's strategy now was the same as it had been in the 80s, to form strong personal relationships with Russian leadership as soon as possible. Ortega has report, reportedly called Putin his brother president. And since the restoration of the relationship, Russia and Nicaragua have coincided on many international issues. In December 2008, Ortega traveled to Moscow to attend a summit with then-president Medvedev, which resulted in multiple bilateral agreements. Also in 2008, Nicaragua provided the unsolicited gesture of recognizing two breakaway republics in Georgia, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. More telling is that it was the first Latin American country and the second country in the world to do so, the first one being Russia. This move, along with Nicaragua's vote against the 2014 UN resolution proclaiming Crimea's independence referendum illegitimate, proves the willingness and ability of Nicaragua to cooperate with Russia. Indeed, Nicaragua has perpetuated the belief that it is an important partner and friend of Russia. In return for such support, Russia seemingly provides Nicaragua with an influential friend on the UN Security Council. It's been noted that Nicaragua is, quote, the most fruitful political relationship that Russia has and where it's made its greatest advances, end quote. It is true that government corruption, underdevelopment, and crimes set the platform for Russia to enter into Latin American arena. As the poorest country in Central America and the second poorest in the Western Hemisphere, Nicaragua fits this criteria perfectly. The recent November 2016 presidential elections in Nicaragua all but cemented the power of an authoritarian dynasty. With Daniel Ortega's return to power, democratic institutions in Nicaragua have deteriorated. According to some reports, the regime of President Ortega has brought the Nicaraguan uh, people to its lowest point ever in 20 years, causing Nicaragua to be one of the few countries in the Western Hemisphere on a prolonged downhill path when it comes to democracy. In the legislative elections in late 2016, Ortega managed to practically remove his opposition, stacking the judiciary in favor, his favor, and removing the independent media. With the opposition denied or divided, and Ortega ensuring that many members of his family were dominant, had dominant positions within the government, it is no wonder that this Latin American country and the Kremlin have restored their relationship. Indeed, this budding relationship with Russia is a natural result of the ties the countries established in 1980. Okay, so for recent economic issues, uh, Russia and Nicaragua's renewed relationship originally had a civilian emphasis, with Russia providing wheat and sorghum to Nicaragua, followed by the delivery of 400 Russian buses in order to improve public transportation. Most notably, Russia forgave Nicaragua its $3 billion debt that dated back to the Soviet era. Nicaraguan leaders were so confident that Moscow would back them up at any cost that they constantly shrugged it off when the U.S. threatened to cut aid off. After George W. Bush's administration declared that it would be postponing a $175 million grant for development projects in Nicaragua, President Ortega assertively stated that Nicaragua would, quote, soon get help from Russia, end quote. In 2013, Nicaragua approved a project to finance and build a transoceanic canal across Nicaragua at an estimated cost of $50 billion. The project was conceded to a Chinese company, and while construction has been delayed, Russia expressed interest in this cross-country canal. Specifically, Russia has stated it would provide the equipment for construction of the canal, as well as security. Increasing trade has also been on the agenda. After Putin visited Nicaragua in July 2014, the Kremlin approached the Sandinista government to secure more imports of Nicaraguan fruits, vegetables, coffee, and beef, since Russia had prohibited the import of these commodities from Europe. Earlier this year, Russian importers visited Nicaragua to gauge the capacity to further increase Nicaraguan imports. Additionally, in October 2016, a vaccine plant was built in Nicaragua. The total cost of the plant was $21 million, of which 14 million was funded by Moscow. In the past few years, the Russian-Nicaraguan partnership has again evolved from a civilian and economic one to a militarized one. Russia recently gained access to Nicaragua's airspace and ports, sold Nicaragua arms and tanks, and received the green light to build government facilities. Military presence has increased both in and around Nicaragua. 
security specialist in Nicaragua assessed that there are about 250 Russian military personnel in the country. Russia has demonstrated that its Navy is on a mission to ramp up its presence in Latin America. On December 6, 2008, a Russian anti-submarine destroyer completed a round trip through the Panama Canal, marking the first time that a Russian or Soviet battleship entered the channel since World War II. The time-honored practice of providing large amounts of military aid and assistance to countries it considers under its influence has once again emerged. In 2008, Russia provided Nicaragua with $10 million in aid and gave the Nicaraguan military modern troop transport helicopters. Then, in 2011, Russian military aid increased to $26.5 million. Further, in October 2013, Nikolai Petrusha, the former top official of the Russian intelligence service, visited Nicaragua to sign an agreement for Russian support in the renovation of Nicaragua's armed forces. This agreement stipulated that Petrusha and the commander of Nicaragua's armed forces would conduct regular consultations with each other. Less than a year later, in September 2014, nearly 50 military cadets and officers from Nicaragua traveled to Russia for extended military training. Since then, Russian military equipment has increasingly appeared in Nicaragua. The equipment includes everything from armored vehicles, mobile rocket, rocket launchers, to helicopters and patrol boats. Not long after, Russia opened a maintenance facility for military vehicles in Nicaragua. Although there are no confirmed military bases yet, there are plans set in place to do so. As recent as 2015, Nicaragua's legislative branch, which is controlled by the Sandinista government, confirmed a decree that enables Russian warships to dock in Nicaraguan ports, as well as authorizing visits by Russian military aircraft and ground forces. It is clear that Nicaragua has substantially increased its military expenditures within the last several years. Last year, Nicaragua received a total of 50 Russian T-72 Bravo-1 tanks, estimated to cost upwards of 80 million U.S. dollars. Such a purchase is a significant move for the second poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere, which spent a total of $71.6 million on its military in 2015. Furthermore, in April of this year, a contingent from Moscow's airborne troops arrived in Managua to discuss upcoming joint exercises between the two countries. This sharp increase of military equipment and assistance in Nicaragua has prompted the then commander of the U.S. Southern Command, General John F. Kelly, to note in his posture statement before the U.S. Senate Armed Services Committee that, quote, under President Putin, we have seen a clear return to Cold War tactics. As part of its global strategy, Russia is using power projection in an attempt to erode U.S. leadership and challenge U.S. influence in the Western Hemisphere. Immediately following Putin's visit to Nicaragua in 2014, the Nicaraguan government approved the building of a Russian GLONASS satellite tracking station. GLONASS is a global navigation satellite system, so Russia's version of our GPS. Russian specialists handle the satellites around the clock, while a team of Nicaraguans are trained to use them. The official Russian explanation for the heavily protected facility, which is surrounded by high walls, is that it's meant to operate as a tracking station for GLONASS. However, it seems plausible that this tracking station could be more of a strategic project between Russia and Nicaragua. Built just outside the capital city of Managua, this Russian facility was constructed on a hillside directly facing the U.S. Embassy. Many U.S. administrators speculate that the new Russian building could have a dual purpose, meaning that the possibility for electronic espionage of the United States is not entirely eliminated. Also, this facility could provide the opportunity to intercept American internet traffic running through an underwater fiber optic cable linking Miami to Latin America and the Caribbean. These moves in Nicaragua further promote the idea that Russia aspires to restore relations with Nicaragua and strengthen its influence on its long-lost Cold War battle prize. Since contact between the two countries was all but terminated, after the downfall of the Soviet Union, it is likely that today Moscow is attempting to make up for lost time. Russia's interest to revive their relationship with Nicaragua, possibly its most critical ally in the region, has not gone unnoticed. Experts in the field see Russia's moves in Nicaragua as a counterstrike to the heightened presence by U.S. military in Eastern Europe. In effect, Russian presence could have more to do with power projection and producing annoyances in response to U.S. presence in Russia's vicinity, such as the Ukraine and Georgia. 
Perhaps Russia believes that by pursuing military cooperation with Nicaragua, it could possibly offset NATO expansion into Eastern Europe, essentially preventing the United States from achieving geopolitical influence. It could be that President Putin wants to enhance Russian authority in Latin America as a method of showing to the U.S. and his country as well that Russia has made a comeback, and its status of strength is reaching that of a global superpower. Russia is essentially sending a very clear-cut message that it is willing and able to engage in a similar manner creating its military forces and economic aid in the domain of the Americas. Still, U.S. reaction to Russian efforts have been ambivalent. Some maintain that there is no cause for concern for the ever-increasing Russian presence in Nicaragua. Others, however, remain a bit more vigilant. Concerns that the aim of Russia's connection with Nicaragua is to work against U.S. influence in the region are valid. For one, the State Department has transferred a Russian expert to desk officer in charge of Nicaragua. Also, many of the U.S. representatives that were recently sent to Nicaragua are proficient in the Russian language and are familiar with Moscow. Another measure that the U.S. has taken is the opposition of American aid to Nicaragua. The Nicaraguan Investment Conditionality Act, NICA, of 2017, has been reintroduced in Congress. Its purpose is to oppose loans at international financial institutions for the government of Nicaragua unless the government of Nicaragua is taking effective steps to hold free, fair, and transparent elections. Last year, after Ortega's re-election under suspicious circumstances in November 2016, the act was intensified and amended by its proponents. Several members of the House insisted that Nicaragua not only reinstate democratic institutions, but also actively tackle corruption and look into any government officers that may be a party to this act. In closing, in the 80s, Nicaragua's Sandinista leaders asserted that Nicaragua did not believe in a, in a position of non-alignment. They saw the world divided into two regions, one dominated by the imperialism of the United States, and the other comprised of the socialist countries headed by the Soviet Union. The Sandinista government of the time made it explicitly obvious on which side it stood. Today, once again, the message is being sent out loud and clear. As for the Russian government, Nicaragua is a crucial first step towards its end goal. This apparent Russian surge appears to be a part of Moscow's renewed expansionist foreign policy. It is very likely that its sustained presence, both military and diplomatic, will provide Russia a gateway to establish itself as a strategic geopolitical ally to Latin America. It is precisely because of this that awareness and discernment of Russian endeavors in Latin America, and more specifically in Nicaragua, is ever more important, both in terms of significant actor molding the international political arena and as a matter of American national security. Obviously, Cuba. Um, Venezuela was a big one, but now with its, you know, demise, it seems just Nicaragua is the only one that has those ties from way back when. Um, also, in regards to the GLONASS station, there was a signals intelligence station in Lourdes, Cuba, from 1961 to 2001, and it was shut down due to economic reasons. Um, Russia simply just couldn't pay to keep it up. But it seems that this new station could be just to counteract that and to, okay, well, we can't be in Cuba, even though it's only 100 miles away from the U.S. Okay, we'll go a little further away and see what we can get. So, it's a very good point, yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Any other questions? Back there is. Yeah, I wonder if you could comment about the relative efficiency of the Panama Canal and the Nicaragua Canal in terms of intercommunicability of ships between the Atlantic and Pacific. Uh, obviously, the, the, the Nicaragua Canal is farther north. It would save a little bit of distance. Uh, but I believe China, um, I've heard that China has controlled both ends of the Panama Canal, which is uh, something that should be very much of concern to the U.S. government. And uh, But, but what, just what, what sort of competition would there be one canal for another? Excuse me, that's a really good point. So the canal, which has not started in Nicaragua, um, it was actually discussed in 2008 uh, between Daniel Ortega and Leonid Brezhnev. And in 2013, it was okayed by Daniel Ortega and Putin. Um, it was supposed to start in yeah, 2013. The main investor was a Chinese investor, um, Wang Jin. So Mr. Wang of HKD, which is Hong Kong Nicaragua Development Group, uh, lost about 85% of his uh, fortune in at the end of 2015. So that is the main reason it hasn't started. But before all that, Nicaragua had stated that they wanted it to be a wider canal, a deeper canal. Um, pass more ships. So yeah, it would definitely rival the Panama Canal and the fact that Russia is very interested in providing equipment, security, um, having a presence there is a, is a big, big concern, definitely. Uh, yes, back there. Um, I'm from Nicaragua. Uh, uh, one thing I wanted to, to make a comment is that the Sandinista, actual Sandinista party mm -hmm. is a totally different party than when they were in power 10 years ago because uh, most of the members are highly corrupt in the party and they are divided. So you have uh, a divided Sandinista party that is called the MRLS, which is the Movimiento Renovador Sandinista. Mm -hmm. So there, there is a very strong opposition. And to that point, my question is uh, uh, the NICA Act. Mm -hmm. doesn't hurt the poor. It hurt the population of Nicaragua, people who are investing, who are totally American funds and, and pro-US uh, policies. So to make a distinction between the government and the population, and, and uh, what is your opinion about, isn't it counterproductive, it's like the Cuban embargo, you know? People get engaged, people want to invest, and with this NICA Act or putting this uh, type of sanctions, Right, and I, I completely agree. I don't think we should, the U.S. should be uh, punishing the people for something that the government is doing. Um, what I would say is maybe we could have, I'm not sure 100% the terms of the act, but what we could do is maybe have some sort of U.S., maybe the embassy there could help implement some of the infrastructure or some of the programs or I think what the US is trying to do is keep the the government from keeping funds to themselves and not giving it to the people um, that being said um, yeah I don't think I don't think completely pulling out of you know not giving any aid any help the people would be conducive to helping the Nicaraguan people and helping both of our interests. Uh, back there. Uh, one comment. I know in three years ago, in 2014, the State Department in South donated two speedboats to the Nicaraguan um, Navy to combat their trafficking. And last three months ago, in April, the U.S. Coast Guard cut the Reliance went to Nicaragua to carry out military exercise to the Nicaraguan Navy, again to uh, fight drug trafficking. Etc. Et mm -hmm. I'm wondering what you think about that and how the U.S. is handling Nicaragua and, and the Ortega regime, where they're trying to let's say, punish them economically, sanction them a little bit, but at the same time trying to like not try to like, remain friends with them at least at the security level. How do you, how is the, how, what do you think about the U.S. trying to balance those issues? How Ortega is playing this game where he's, he's approaching the U.S. for aid, Russia and China at the same time? Right. Um. I mean, I, it's kind of hard to 
obviously they're all out for you know the, the country's interest and supposedly the people's interest. Um, one of the things that the government official said about the GLONASS station was that it was to help counteract drug trafficking because you know it's in Central America, it's such a strategic position between the U.S., Mexico, South America. Um, but I've also read a lot of, or I read reports about how some of the, you know, drug or something was going into the government, or how they were, I mean, pretty corrupt. So, I can see, does that, can, does that answer your question? I'm sorry, I heard that. <laughs> All these people are the U.S. Nicaragua security relations, the inspire of you know, the U.S. condemning the Ortega regime, we have maintained some level of security relations by yes. making people and sending a, a color to yes. train them over there. Yes. No, and that, that I mean, that is that is a good thing. There have been some, I guess, security measures that have been implemented, but at the same time, I don't think I don't think it's enough. I don't think it's enough uh, for the you know the people, the the very nepotistic uh, government. I mean, his. I believe his brother Humberto Ortega is the or was the you know defense minister. Um, his wife is right there. She's the vice president. Um, so there has have been some advances, but I don't think I don't think it's enough. And I think that's what the U.S. is is trying to help push. Um, uh, right there. Uh, in your research, did you find any unique? Uh, aspects of the Ortega and Putin relationship. Did Putin, was he ever a case officer in Nicaragua when he was in the KGB? Did they go to the military academy together? That is a good question. I did not come across anything like that. I know um, there were several just officers back in the 80s going back and forth for training, but I never came across Putin specifically. I will definitely look into that. Yeah, they're about the same age. Yeah, that would be, yes. I did not research any of that. Um, I did look up the uh, State Department travel advisory. Um, I think we need a visa just for 100, I don't know if it's 120 or 90 days, something like that. But I will say regarding education and literacy, a lot of the arguments from the pro Sandinista side is that yes, you know, they've maybe increased education, health care, a lot of the social programs have increased somewhat. Um, literacy has de decreased. But I would counter, um, in 1961, Cuba pretty much eradicated illiteracy in its country. And that's a good thing, but at what cost? So, any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Too, if I can remember what they were. Uh, on Cuba, uh, I have a theory that our thought, uh, the relations with Cuba, was motivated by the possibility of uh, Cuba granting concessions to Russia. For instance, like for the Glasnost mm -hmm. uh, station, did you run any, in, in any indication, indication that the Russians approached the Cubans about that before they settled on Nicaragua? So, I know they did approach several other countries, um, even outside Latin America. They um, wanted to go to Vietnam, Seychelles, uh, Cuba, Venezuela, even before um, going on right now. Um, I think they settled Nicaragua just because, honestly, just because Nick, the people, Nick, or the government was just so willing to accept it and to um, just say, look here, yes, help us economically, help us militarily, we'll help you however we can. Um, there was talk about that Lourdes station I talked about earlier. There was talk about in Cuba to revive it. Um, but then Putin denied it and said that wasn't going to happen. So I'm not, I'm not sure. My second question is, uh, is there any insurgent activity in Nicaragua these days? That is a good question. Um, I, I didn't really research that. In my, so 
I, I would venture to say yes, possible, but I didn't go to that. Yes. Uh, what are the Nicaraguans doing with the Russian tanks? That's a good question. Um, it ha that has caused a lot of concern, not only to the U.S., but to the surrounding countries. Costa Rica, Honduras, Guatemala, they're saying, why, why do you need 50 tanks? Um, I mean, the major disputes they've had with neighboring countries is, um, with Honduras, there's, you know, a lake that kind of touches both of the countries um, that goes out to the Pacific. But that 50 tanks, you don't need 50 tanks for that. Um, so I don't know, that's, that's a question that I was asking too. What, why do they need this many weapons? This, so, yes? Uh, is Iran doing anything significant in Nicaragua? It's a good question. I didn't look into Iran, but yeah, another point. So actually back in the early 1900s, the U.S. was ready to build a canal there. Um, something, a change of, I think it was Celaya, even before Celaya, with President Nicaragua. Um, it fell through, didn't happen. Um, There's a huge military presence in Nicaragua, and then the revolution happened. Uh, so yes, I think it is very telling that Russia is so eager to, as soon as the canal was announced and it was they're ready to provide equipment, provide money, resources needed. Um, I don't think they have the money for $50 billion that is needed. Um, so since it fell through with the concession to the Chinese, I'm not sure how long it will be to But yes, I, I think it is, especially since it rivals yeah, the Panama Canal. So I'll take one more question. So no more questions. Okay. Looking into the future, what do you think is the future for what in, uh, Nicaragua Russia relations? Uh, you can already touch a little bit. Ortega just got reelected last year, he's 71, so he's probably going to fulfill the full mandate. Um, and even if he's unhealthy, his wife can just step in and seems like she has the same ideology as, as her husband. So, what do you think is next? Russia already has a training center there, uh, the, the Marshal Suko, the Boys of Tanks, the Golan Station, what else could? Russia won in Nicaragua, what else could Nicaragua, the European region, won from Russia for the next four or five years? So, I don't see, I see an increase of Russian um, personnel and military in Nicaragua. Um, like you said, he'll live out his term, probably his wife will succeed him. Um, there are elections, I believe, in Russia next year. We'll see if those are free and fair elections, or who comes in next, or in states. Um, I don't think there's a need to adopt a Red Scare mentality, but I do think it's very important to be vigilant and to be aware of what's going on. Don't discount you know, any of the activities. Don't just say, don't take anything that is at face value. Um, and just to, to remain, remain aware. Okay, thank you.